Well, good morning, everyone. Today is the last official day of the semester. And so today we're going to be wrapping up this course um, by kind of walking through uh, a nice review of all of the key uh, concepts that we've covered in this course. I'm hoping there'll be a little bit of time at the end of today's class to answer questions. Um, also a friendly reminder, your case study is due tonight along with the last homework. And the final exam is tomorrow from noon to 3.45 p.m. It will happen just like um, we did the midterm where I'll release it on Blackboard at that time and it will be due on Blackboard as a single submission. And I will be available to answer questions uh, via Zoom where you can just pop in and send me chat messages and I can respond. Or if you prefer, you could just send me email. It might just take a little bit longer. Are there any uh, questions that you will all would like me to answer before we kind of jump in and talk about um, uh, reviewing for the final exam. No? Okay. So let's go ahead and jump in. So we're looking at final exam reviewing. Keeping in mind, we've been focusing on chapters four, five, and six of our text by Felder and Rousseau with chapter four focusing on material balance fundamentals. Which is, I would argue, about half of this course material. And then chapter five and chapter six, looking at single phase systems, And chapter six, multi-phase. Right, and then the whole concept is, you know, looking at material balances. Or chemical processes. So let's break these areas down one at a time, starting with our fundamentals of material balances. So in general, what are the first things we looked at? is classification. Processes. Where we considered things as transient or steady state. And we looked at comparing things in terms of whether it was a batch process, a continuous process, or semi-batch. And so, you know, here what I would say it's kind of 
know these terms and the implications. and assumptions that can be made. For these processes. The next uh, really big thing we looked at was our, I would argue, the fundamental material balance equation, where we had our input minus our output plus any generation minus consumption equals accumulation. And so this is definitely, I would say a key expression to be able to know and apply for essentially every material balance you'll ever see. And we also discussed drawing flowcharts, which um, is, is a big thing. So, you know, you want to be able to draw problems out. to identify unknowns. And knowns in a process. And we looked at degrees of freedom. So like I said, be sure to know how to determine degree of freedom values for a problem based off whether you're looking at it in terms of molecular species, atomic species, and even when we talked about it, uh, extensive reaction. also looked at on single and multiple unit operations or for example we have a single operation we have a process, we have an input and an output. Being able to write overall material balances. as well as component right so looking at m1 equal m2 in this process example above and for components things like x1 m1 is equal to x2 m2 kind of thing and understanding the implications of being able to do both 
material balances in terms of total uh, material as well as uh, specific components. And then in looking at multiple processes, we have something like this, it's a little more complex. I could say process one. I could look at balances over each individual component. So over process one, I can also look at balances over process two. And then I can also consider the overall over the entire system, the entire process. And the implications for you being able to do balances in that regard, right? So if I'm looking at process one, I would say M1 plus M2 is equal to M3. If I was looking at process two, I would say M3 plus M4 is equal to M5. And if I was looking at the overall system, I would say, well, M1 plus M2 plus M4 is equal to M5. And so being able to look at material balances over individual processes or unit operations, as well as the overall process and the overall system allows us to be able to solve more complex uh, problems, right? And it's important, once again, you know, to consider degrees of freedom over these balances. where you want to start where your degrees of freedom are zero or the process is effectively specified to solve for unknowns and then use what the solutions you obtain to solve for other parts of a process. Next, we look at chemical reactions, or I should say material imbalances. Involving chemical reactions. And so there is a lot of things that we consider here Things like stoichiometry and ensuring that we have balanced reactions. We also considered reactions in terms of limiting reagents. Which I knew on my Thing did that. As well as excess reagents. We had considered things like fractional excess. of a limiting reagent, oh, excuse me, just a reagents in general. And we looked at conversion. We looked at, let's say, fractional excess. It was moles fed minus moles needed or stoichiometry, divided by 
provided by moles needed or the stoichiometric need. I'll be consistent. When we looked at conversion, it was moles reacted over moles fed. We also looked at chemical equilibrium. Right, K or KEQ, however you like to call it. Where it was, you know, mole fraction of your products. And it was the product of all of them. And it was the product of all the mole fractions of your reactants. Or it's typically a function of temperature. We also looked at things that involved multiple reactions where we had to consider yield of a reaction, which was our moles of desired product form. over the moles of, or I should say the maximum moles the product that could form assuming no side reaction So it's a comparison of what was formed over, you know, what was the what was the potential for formation of my product. We also looked at selectivity, which was the moles of desired product formed over the moles of iron undesired product formed. So being able to use this information to solve for material balances um, will be important. So, so here I would, I would definitely, you know, know how to calculate these values and use this information Material balance problems. I think the last thing in chapter six um, was looking at combustion reaction material balances. And here we looked at complete versus incomplete combustion. So know the difference for complete combustion uh, results in CO2 being produced and incomplete combustion results in just uh, CO being formed. We also considered looking at percent excess air. And that was the, the big takeaways for combustion reactions. 
Oh, and one last thing I would definitely say outside of these extensive reaction. Our chi term. I would I would definitely know how to use extensive reactions to solve in and out tables. So that's, you know, I would say definitely the key information for chapter four. It's quite a bit, but, and, you know, that was, you know, the subject of the midterm. But I would say, you know, expect to see some of this on the final exam. You will see more emphasis on chapters five and six because, we, you know, you haven't been tested on that information, but, you know, the foundation of uh, single and multi-phase system balances uh, definitely does lie in the fundamentals presented in chapter four. Are there any specific questions, comments, things I can clarify or clear up uh, before I start talking about uh, chapter five content? Okay, so we'll keep moving, looking at chapter five, which was looking at single phase systems. And so this one was a, a little shorter as compared to four and six, but nevertheless, the information presented is equally as important we considered looking at the density of mixtures. Where we can assume volume additivity. Where the density of a mixture is looking at the sum of the mole fraction I'm sorry the mass fraction times the density of that substance so I'll say where x of i equals mass fraction I and rho sub I is the density of I. You can also look at things in terms of specific volumes, which is run over rho sub M, which is the sum of I equal one to N of X sub I over rho sub I. So it gives you some variations of the same value. And it's, you know, not really one over the other. It really depends on the substance, which, which value is going to be more accurate. Um, the next big thing we looked at was the ideal gas law. And its importance as an equation of state, PV is equal to NRT, or P, V dot is equal to N dot, RT for flowing processes, where P is the absolute pressure. of a gas. V or V 
dot is the volume or volumetric flow rate of our gas. And our n dot is our number of moles or our molar flow rate. R was our ideal gas constant. And T was our absolute temperature. So I, I would definitely say for this, how to apply the ideal gas law. to material balance problems. And for the calculation at process variables. Meaning if I give you three of the four terms, you should be able to use ideal gas law to calculate the fourth. Um, also keeping in mind how the ideal gas constants value changes as a function of the units that are used to describe it. Right where we have, we could say R is equal to 8.314 joules per mole Kelvin. It's also equal to 0 0.08205 liter atmospheres per mole Kelvin. And it's also equal to 10.73 PSIA cubic feet per pound mole degree R. And so I'm not gonna expect you to memorize them, but you should know one that they change and two, like which one you may need for a given problem that you have. Fairly certain your book has ideal gas values in it, most likely in the appendix, or the, yeah, the appendices in the back. So go ahead and make sure you take a look at that for some of those values, as well as the unit conversions that are present in the back of the book. We also looked at things with the ideal gas law in terms of ideal gas mixtures. Where we defined partial pressure. Of a substance or P sub I times V is equal to N sub I times RT, which implied that the partial pressure of a substance was equal to the mole fraction of that substance in the mixture times the total pressure of the mixture. We also look things in terms of um, volume fractions. I wish I knew why my pen was being off. Or we had a similar expression for the volume fraction of a substance was looking at the mole fraction times the total volume, which implied that, you know, volume percent is equal to mole percent for ideal gas mixtures.
next thing we looked at was non-ideal equations of state. You know, the importance of critical temperature. And pressure. As it relates to non ideal equations of state, and we looked at uh, several. First one being the Virial equation. Or RP V hat over RT. Ended up being a series solution. V hat was our specific molar volume of our substance. And, you know, B, C, and D are empirical constants. which were, you know, functions. Of the critical pressures, temperature. We also looked at van der Waals. which looked a little like this. Pressure is equal to RT divided by V hat minus P minus A over V hat squared, as well as looking at Selvred Lequang or SRK, which was similar. That had a little more in it. And so a lot of times, if, if, if you'd see this, I would give you some of the information or show you how to calculate the constants. And then you'd have to use these expressions to calculate certain values for a non-ideal gas. Uh, the last one we definitely looked at that I would argue is way more important and you would more likely see on the egg final is a compressibility factor, Z, where, you know, PV over RT is equal to one for an ideal gas. And for not an, a non-ideal, it equals Z, where your C is your compressibility factor. Right, and so your equation becomes, you know, P V hat equals Z R T. And you know, uh, when we looked at finding uh, our compressibility factor, we used uh, our compressibility charts. Where Z was a function of our reduced temperature and our reduced pressure, where our reduced temperature was the current temperature as a function of the critical temperature, and the reduced pressure was our current pressure over the critical pressure. And 
And so you would use the charts to find your Z. And that would allow you to calculate your process variables for the non-ideal gas. The last thing that we touched on was K's rule for non-ideal mixtures. And so for these substances, you have to calculate a pseudo critical temperature and pressure. Which was the sum one to n of your mole fraction times the critical value of that substance and the same thing for your pseudo critical pressure. mole fraction of the substance times the critical pressure of that substance. And with that, you can solve for your compressibility factor of the mixture using the charts. And then if necessary, you can also solve for your specific molar volume of the mixture by this question here. And that was the key material here. So for definitely for the compressibility, I would say know how to determine Z and ZM if it's a mixture using You reduce pressure calculations and the charts. So are there any questions or points that I can clarify in the chapter five section? And if not, I can keep rolling looking at chapter six. It's kind of a speak now or forever. Hope that the final works out for you. Okay. So with that, we can keep moving. Jumping into the last section. Looking at chapter six, which was you know, looking at multi-phase systems, which had some, you know, pretty big concepts. And it emphasized looking at systems in equilibrium. You know, we were looked at vapid liquid equilibrium a lot. We looked at liquid liquid equilibrium a little bit on solid equilibrium. However, for most chemical processes, you know, we're going to be considering these types of systems more so than the solid liquid. Those just so because primarily because solid liquid equilibrium uh, isn't as common as compared to vapor liquid and uh, liquid liquid systems. Uh, the first thing we kind of touched based on was phase diagrams and you know the various sections of the diagram it relates to you know this critical point you got your triple point here as well as you know your various phases oh. My computer's getting a little overheated. Temperature, pressure, it looks kind of like this. 
this is a critical point. Triple point. And you have, you have your solid phase here, vapor, your gas, liquid. And then beyond the critical point, you have a supercritical fluid. We can't see. Oh, thank you for that. Yeah. It ends the share when it crashes. I forget to. All right. So, you know, the various points on a phase diagram should be able to kind of, you know, look at phase diagram and understand the implications of where the phases are and, you know, what it means to exist on the uh, li equilibrium lines, you know, this being the vapor liquid equilibrium, solid liquid equilibrium line, and how it affects what we can expect to see from a system. The next thing we considered was vapor pressure as a measure of substance volatility. And we measured vapor pressure from, you know, a number of ways. One being the Clapeyron equation. We're at the P sub star, where P star is our vapor pressure over dt, I should probably use capital T, is equal to your enthalpy of vaporization, or your latent heat of vaporization over the temperature minus the dis difference between your specific molar volume of the gas minus the specific molar volume of your liquid. However, that's not in a lot of ways a very effective way of calculating vapor pressure, primarily because a lot of times, specific volumes of gas and liquid, enthalpy of vaporization, all that becomes a little trickier to, to, to know for various substances. And so there are a few ways to approximate this. One by looking at the Clausius Clapeyron equation. Which is an empirical approximation of the Clapeyron by linearizing it can get the natural log of our vapor pressure is equal to the negative latent heat of vaporization over RT plus B, where B is an empirical constant. And this us allows was to linearize the expression where if y is equal to ln p star and x is equal to 1 over t, m is equal to negative delta h v over r, and b is equal to, well, b, following this, you know, equation of a line form. And so it's a graphical way of looking at a vapor pressure as a function of temperature. There was a couple more ways that we could find vapor pressure. Definitely one I would want you to know, Antoine's equation, just because it's a really easy way of calculating vapor pressures of substances. You know, where these ABC values are just the constants. And they're located in the table in the book. 